So many European cities want to be smart cities, front runners in the use of big data and artificial intelligence. But a smart city is not necessarily a just city, a green city or a wise city. Smart cities, smart city policies need to be guided by public values. The Corona crisis has given a boost to smart technologies from teleworking to remote learning to e-commerce. There are public values at stake. And in the next slides, I will give you some examples of how smart technologies can undermine public values. Just a minute. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, different public values may clash. And some of the examples I'll be giving relate to the Corona crisis. The lockdowns have given a boost to digitalization. This webinar is an example of it. Um, smart technologies help us get through the crisis, but we should think about the public values which are at stake before making our current reliance on these technologies permanent. So this first example is a cute example from Colombia. Small robots delivering food to Corona patients who were in quarantine. This way, contact between humans is minimized. Do we want this to be the future of delivery services? How would the proliferation of robots impact the distribution of public space, especially on pavements? Public space, after all, is a scarce good. Do delivery robots steal jobs from delivery workers? Are those de delivery jobs decent jobs that we should retain? Or does the production and maintenance of robots create new and better jobs? These are questions a government or a local council should ask before allowing and promoting delivery robots. And as for values, you see that efficiency might clash with the quality of public spaces and with social equity. Trying to get to my next slide. Just a minute. It's about serving robots, and they raise uh, basically the same sort of questions uh, as delivery robots. Serving robots are used uh, as waiters in bars and restaurants. They have become more popular during the corona crisis, but do we want them to stick around? This is an example from uh, Brussels. They use the Fix My Street app, um, like other European cities do. It's an app which allows citizens to report broken street furniture or waste dumping or graffiti to their municipality. And you see there's a, quite a difference between two neighborhoods, uh, Molenbeek Saint-Jean, which is a, a poor neighborhood with large ethnic minorities, and Ixelles, which is a trendy neighborhood with many students and EU officials. So what would happen if the decisions on maintenance of the public space were automated and based exclusively on reports via the app? Uh, rich neighborhoods would be better cleaned and maintained than poor neighborhoods, since people in these poor neighborhoods on average have less digital skills. So the efficiency of smart city solutions may lead to discrimination and inequality. The next example is about facial recognition cameras. They're already in use by the London police. Um, Street cameras are connected to live facial recognition software and a database of digital photos. The system can help the police to identify and arrest wanted criminals. But in, in order to do that, the faces of all passers-by have to be captured by the cameras. 
so here we have a clash between uh, security and privacy. Although, if you're black, you might not feel very secure with these cameras. The current facial recognition software has a discriminatory bias. Non-white people are much more likely to be flagged up in error. This is an example about uh, mobility as a service. It might be the future of transport. Mobility as a service platforms offer travelers a personalized door-to-door -door journey using different modes of transport. Trains, trams, buses, taxis, shared bikes, shared cars, etc. With a single app, you can reserve, use and pay for all these modes of transport. And in Helsinki, the commercial app WIM has helped reduce the number of car rides. But those apps, they want to, tra to track your smartphone all the time. And also they would like to have access to your digital calendar so they know in advance where you want to go. Uh, there's a clash here between sustainability and privacy. Uh, it also raises questions about the future. Will people who want to protect their privacy still be able to use public transport, shared bikes, etc.? Next example, remote mon monitoring of uh, elderly people. Um, you can monitor their well-being with uh, sensors in their house. Um, and that's supposed to deliver time savings for care workers and informal carers. But in practice, uh, some elderly people deliberately leave the refrigerator door open uh, just to receive a phone call from a carer. So um, not that much time saving after all. Uh, technological fixes in the care sector often overlook the fact that illness and mental decline are social phenomena. phenomena. Um, senior people want to communicate, they want company, they want personal advice. Therefore, home automation might not be as efficient as engineers think it is. Um, efficiency here clashes with the values of connectedness and also human dignity. Uh, which is the same in the case of social robots, uh, which are supposed to uh, help feel elderly people who are living alone less uh, lonely. Social robots uh, keep them company, talk with them, etc. The question here is, uh, can interaction with robots replace human contact? Um, again, efficiency clashes with connectedness and human dignity. Next example, neighborhood watch apps. Um, quite popular both in the United States and in Europe. Um, they're supposed to prevent crime. Um, and sometimes these apps like Nextdoor are being promoted by municipalities or by the police. Um, Residents can use these apps to warn each other for suspicious situations. But research shows that these apps often do not increase security. At best, they give people a sense of security. And at worst, these apps can encourage fear, mental stress, and mutual distrust. They may even cause discrimination against people who look different, people who are not recognized as being part of the neighborhood. And if you're black, the police being called on you can be deadly, in some countries at least. That's what the Black Lives Matter protests are about. This is an example about smart electricity grids. It's a picture from a recent webinar we did. Um, in one smart grid in Amsterdam, households got batteries in their home to store electricity from their solar panels but they had no control over these batteries. An anonymous operator used the stored electricity for trading on the wholesale electricity market. Uh, so people could see the battery in their home, heating up, uh, lights blinking, but they didn't know why that happens. And that reduced their motivation to be part of the smart grid. 
So if you want people to be smart with energy and a smart grid, you need to give them a level of control over the algorithms that steer their appliances. Also, you need to give them control over their personal data. If not, they might pull out and unplug, unplug their battery. Uh, so designers of smart grids should ensure that efficiency and sustainability do not clash with the values of autonomy and protection of personal data. This is an example from the UK. Uh, in the British city of Bristol, 25% of the population has already been processed by an algorithm. And the algorithm uses 35 sets of personal data to assign risk scores to children and young people, scores between zero and uh, 100. And these scores predict the risk that an individual becomes a victim of child abuse. So the more your characteristic match with the characteristics of previous victims, the higher your risk score. And uh, Bristol Council is considering using this system also for predict predicting criminal behavior and drug abuse. Uh, this raises a lot of questions like, uh, is trust in the government undermined if every contact that you have with the government can lead to a higher risk score? Uh, is it acceptable to give a risk score to someone because they fit a certain profile instead of judging them individually? Do people have the right to know their risk score? Um, efficiency clashes with good governance in this case. Um, good governance is an important element of democracy and it includes transparency, the right to be informed, the right to obtain human intervention and decisions, and the right not to be discriminated against. And during the Corona crisis, some uh, British councils has even, even gone uh, farther and started cooperating with uh, private uh, data brokers, uh, freely exchanging uh, lots of personal data, mixing consumer data and citizen data, feed them, feeding them into uh, algorithms in order to predict which citizens might encounter social problems during the corona crisis. Um, it is often questionable whether the data companies have acquired their consumer data lawfully. Um, and it is questionable whether councils have the right to hand over your data to co commercial parties. Uh, so the question is, do we want these big brother practices, however well-intentioned, to become entrenched after the corona? crisis after it's over is your risk of uh, marital breakdown as you can see in the picture is that really a matter for the council or for data brokers uh, citizen scoring by the way will be the subject of the next CDN webinar on 5 November um, well this slide is not really visible I think Um, you can wonder what the future will bring once risk scores are combined with the data from live facial recognition cameras. Um, with these two elements, you already have two essential building blocks of the social credit system in China. The social credit system, which is a very invasive and pervasive surveillance system. Is that the future that we want? That is. So at this point in my presentation, I would like to ask you who would rather live in a stupid city than in a smart city? You can post your reply in the chat if you want. Uh, now about the charter. Um, why did we write this charter? Uh, a smart city does not have to be a dystopian city of mass surveillance, dehumanization and equality. But we have to realize that there are important values at stake. Local politicians have to discuss the values they want to see protected and promoted by technology, uh, discuss them with citizens and in the city council, of course. Um, new technology needs inclusive, gender sensitive public debate and democratic control, especially since different values might clash 
as we have seen in the examples. Um, and that's why we wrote a charter for the smart city. It aims to help local politicians and activists make informed moral judgments on technological innovations. And the web, um, well, this is how we drafted the charter. Uh, several roundtables to gather input. And the website with the charter is still online and you can still leave your comments there. Um, this is one of the 18 principles in the charter. It's about combating the social and digital divides. Um, principle plus uh, explanation. Uh, and of course, this is especially relevant in the corona crisis. Many forms of inequality have grown during the crisis. There are those who can work safely from home and those who cannot. There are those with permanent jobs and those with precarious work who have lost their income. So inclusion, the theme of this webinar, has become all the more important. Uh, also, as regards school children, um, millions of them have hardly done any schoolwork during the lockdowns, partly because they don't have access to a computer. And this cries out for more inclusive policies. The charter also contains some inspiring examples. Uh, this is a free app that allows you to find the nearest public toilet. It's been developed by a woman who suffers from urinary incontinence herself. And she made the app using open data provided by municipalities. It shows the importance in, of open data. Uh, this is from my own city, Amsterdam. Amsterdam has decided to have all the algorithms that are used in the city, both by the municipality itself and by companies, uh, checked for uh, negative effects such as discrimination. And this is from Catalonia. Um, Som Mobilitat, it's a cooperative for sharing uh, electric cars uh, and with the support of uh, several municipalities they've uh, uh, developed their own digital platform and a smartphone app to facilitate uh, car sharing. Um, and it's a cooperative, no commercial uh, goals. And the last good practice is for from Antwerp, where they have done a big uh, citizen sensing project to uh, measure air pollution. And uh, we'll be organizing a webinar on citizen sensing or citizen science, by the way, on Friday 6, no, that should be November, sorry, Friday 6 November. You can uh, register at the website of the Green European Foundation. And these are two examples from uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, which are in the Charter. One is from uh, Tirana, um, where um, um, one of you is at the moment, and uh, one is from uh, Bruno. Uh, Tirana uh, is quite uh, progressive in uh, developing its own open source self software and uh, Bruno has a large program for uh, particip participatory budgeting. Um, well, at the website of the Green European Foundation, you can download our charter in five languages. And um, at the website I mentioned earlier, you can read the charter online and also watch uh, related videos and you're invited to post your comments. Um, that was it. I hope I didn't use too much of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, a lot, and uh, for bringing this uh, term also dump city. We were hoping to coin it in our publication, but <laughs> I guess somebody already coined it. And um, yeah, I would like to give now word to Hannah that will talk to us about inclusion. Yeah, first of all, Richard, thank you for your insightful presentation. And 
or very interesting uh, case studies. Uh, as for my presentation, it's going to be a small introduction into the activity we're going to do on inclusion and uh, sustaining uh, rights. Uh, and um, as uh, yeah, very simple thing to go through the slide. It's just boring. Can you hear me now better? Okay. So, uh, as the citizens have been always a core of a city, the success of any city can be defined only when it's built for dwellers and contributes to their well being. Um, and when we talk about the concept of smart cities, so we often think about inclusive cities that are smart enough to provide sustainable, accessible, as well as eco-friendly uh, urban infrastructure and solutions to their citizens that can ease their lives and also make them more engaged in the places they are living in. But in reality, as Richard mentioned, a lot of smart cities are neither smart nor inclusive and leaving millions of people behind. Um, and uh, for example, according to the uh, Smart Cities for All Global Survey, 60% of global experts believe that smart cities are hailing persons with disabilities. And speaking in the European framework, there are 80 million people living uh, with disabilities in Europe, and these citizens are hardly going to appreciate smart buses or fresh public stores unless they have basic access uh, to their mobility equipment. And it's not just about people with disabilities, but a wide variety of social groups, because smart cities involve a complex web factors that make them inclusive. And as you could uh, see on the previous slide, uh, we can in brief talk about uh, three dimensions, which is spatial inclusion. Uh, and it is about um, guaranteeing, um, uh, providing affordable necessities, such as housing, water, and sanitation. Then it's social inclusion, which is about having a city that guarantees equal rights and participation of all, including the most marginalized groups. Uh, and then economic inclusion, which is about creating jobs and guaranteeing uh, urban residents the opportunity to benefit from their economic growth, and which is a critical component of overall urban inclusion. Uh, in addition, there can be different dimensions like smart, uh, like smart uh, prosperity, resilience, and governance. Uh, and talking about participation, when citizens think of a smart urban transformation, uh, they often focus on the deployment of technologies and making them more uh, smarter in the digital sense, but they are often, in this concept of designing smart cities, uh, citizens are mostly regarded as users and consumers rather than sources of innovation. And that is why to shape more inclusive urban communities that serve every group of society. Uh, it is vital to promote a vision towards smart cities that relies on co-creation and co-implementation where citizens are seen as city makers and co-creators and can fully engage uh, into participatory governance and policy making in a city for all. Um, yeah, that, that was a uh, small introduction for the activity and as for the activity itself, uh, it is going to be about discussing and analyzing platforms um, that you know uh, in the cities, communities or countries through the principles of the charter. Uh, and how it's going to work. First, you need to choose a topic in the framework of which you would like to discuss platforms uh, that are used in your community or city or country, or just the platforms that you know to be implemented in different countries or on different continents. And if you don't know those platforms, we invite you to, um, to envision the ones that you would like to have uh, in the area you're living in on this particular topic. Uh, these are four topical groups, citizen participation and democracy, health, mobility, and local services. And uh, when you have decided on the topic, you can write it near your name. So we can then uh, assign you to the, uh, to the breakout rooms. As a working tool, we will use morale uh, board where you uh, will be able to make notes while discussion. And as you can see, each group already have um, one note and listing principles of the charter that, uh, that we will think will be helpful for you uh, while we're reflecting on these platforms. Uh, and you will have around 30 minutes and then we'll come together and reflect on your ideas, experiences all together. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hannah, uh, and thank you, Richard, also for uh, uh, your speeches. And we are now going to stop the uh, streaming on Facebook.